it's on our website. I wrote this all the way back in October, but I've been updating. It's called An Answer to Those Who Claim That African Americans Are Hebrew or Lost Jews. Now, this first section goes into the history of the Hebrew Israelite movement in America. I'm going to skip that for now because I want to get to right, the beginning. And I always teach that if you want to know, if you want to have knowledge and understanding, you got to go to the origin of it. If you try to use a narrative, it doesn't start at the origin. It picks up somewhere later on in the middle or something like that. And you try to use that to understand history, you will always be misguided. Okay? So here we go. What follows is a discussion of the actual historical documentation of not only Belante history, but also the Hebrew and Israelite origin. Okay? Point number one. The existence of Balanta ancient ancestors and their genetic record has already been documented. And in particular, those people of the haplogroup group EV38, which originated in the Horn of Africa about 42,300 years before the present. Okay? This is not me saying that. These are genetic scientists saying that Balanta people have this haplogroup group EV38 which originated 42,000 years ago. And if you want more information on this, you click the link, it'll take you to another post where I'm reviewing right, the genetic documentation on uh, uh, Belanta DNA. Okay? So there's more information there. All of this is coming from the books. Point two, okay? the spiritual principles of Belanta ancient ancestors from that time up until the establishment of the first dynasty in Kemet. Okay? And 1,500 years before any mention of Hebrews and Jews, or Israelite, has been documented. So, if you read the 26 principles of the great belief of the Balanta ancestors, you can learn the principles of our spirituality. It existed 1,500 years before. Hebrews even exist in history. Now, right then and there, here's the problem that some people have. When, we, when, when African American people, when their ancestors were brought here, and we could no longer speak our language, we could no longer you know, use our names, right? we could no longer practice our spirituality openly, right? within two or three generations, we were severed from our lineage and heritage, okay? We lost our identities. And the only reference that some of us had or were allowed to consult was the Bible. So for many generations, we learned history only from one source. And it was a narrative that came out of the, the Bible. And that was what is implanted in us. And this is what some people are still using today in order to understand history. Now, here's the update, what we know now. Okay? So first of all, Sheikh Antibia, in the book, The African Origins of Civilization, Sheikh Antibia is a Senegalese physicist, anthropologist, who ran the radiocarbon dating lab in Senegal, meaning, the deep science that actually tests the physical objects of antiquity and gives them the, the carbon dates where you can identify when they existed. He was the head of the laboratory. So he's one of our own scholars. He was the head of the laboratory doing this. And among other things, one of the things he did was the radiocarbon dating on skin tissues from these ancient remains. Okay? He put together this chronology the simplified diagram of the probable process of the differentiation of the races under the influence of physical factors. So starting from the beginning, five million to two million years ago, you had Australopithecus gracile, right? Gracile means, you know, like uh, 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 your hand is flexible. And Australopithecus robustus, that's five to two million years ago. That eventually evolved into Homo habilis. Habilis means tool-making man. 
So with our dexterity in our hand, we started using rocks and using that to cut things and smash things and using it as a tool along with other instruments. We were, you know, um, using sticks and we were taking grasses and tying them and those kinds of things. Okay. Homo habilis eventually evolves to Homo erectus. Erectus means upright. So a million years ago, now you have upright men. And about this time, right, um, from this time, at some point, right, Homo erectus migrates throughout the African continent and actually leaves the African continent through the uh, Isthmus of Gibraltar and goes into what we call today Europe. Now, these descendants of Homo erectus were called, are called in anthropology Neanderthal men. Okay, this is 110,000 years ago. So you have Homo erectus in a million years, and almost 900,000 years later, Homo erectus finally leaves the African continent. But Neanderthal man dies out and becomes extinct, doesn't exist anymore. Okay? Those Homo erectus that stayed in Africa eventually evolved to Homo sapiens sapiens. Okay? This means, sapiens, Homo means man, and sapiens means wise. So wise, wise man. Okay? This Homo sapiens sapiens, right, evolves in 150,000 to 130,000 years ago in the uh, uh, Old Divai Gorge. I'm going to show you a map of this in a minute. Okay. All right. So now, at this point, this Homo sapiens sapiens is what we call modern man. Right now, modern man only lives in Africa. Homo sapiens sapiens as a species has not left Africa yet. So modern man is within Africa. The first Homo sapiens sapiens to leave modern Africa leave around 40,000 years ago and they arrive in Europe. And the name in anthropology for the first black African modern human being to migrate into Europe is called Grimaldi. The Grimaldi Negro. So it's a black African person that is now in Europe 40,000 years ago. Now, between this time, between 40,000 and 20,000 years ago, right, is what Sheikh Anta Diop says is the period of differentiation between the Grimaldi Negro and what is known as the Cro Magnon. Okay? So we're in a different climate now. Okay, we're in different conditions. And the laws of evolution say that whatever traits or genetic, random genetic mutations help you to survive is going to increase the reproductivity of that gene set. Okay, so we have the first mutation of the Grimaldi man at 20,000 years ago. Now, from 20,000 years ago is what is called the worm glaciation. For the next few thousand years, Europe gets really freaking cold, okay? Really, really cold. These Cro-Magnon people living there that were once the Grimaldi man have to adapt. One of the adaptations is the cold air. If you breathe in cold air and it goes to your lungs, it, caught, it can damage your lungs. So when you breathe through your nostrils, as soon as the air enters the nostrils, the temperature of your body starts to heat the air so that it can go into the lungs without damaging them. When you're in a colder environment, the longer the nasal passage, the longer the air can be heated. Okay. So these long, instead of having a short, broad, wide nose, now these narrow, slow and narrow, it slows down the flow and it makes it longer, causes the air in the nasal cavity, right, a longer time to be heated up. And this is advantageous for survival. In addition, the melanin in our skin acts as a light absorber, okay? So it absorbs light, but it also screens out various rays so that it doesn't harm us. In the European environment during the worm glaciation, 
right? <clears throat> there was a lack of sunlight, a lot less sunlight than in Africa. And so having a lot of skin melanin pigmentation, would, one of the effects would be that your body would not produce vitamin D. So in order to produce a sufficient amount of vitamin D that helps with what? Bones. If you fall and you don't want your bone breaking, you got to have strong bone. In a harsh environment, right, the stronger your bones, the better your capacity to survive. So at the same time that the nasal passages, the long nasal passages are an environmental advantage, so too is having lighter skin because your body is able to then use limited sunlight to produce vitamin D. So in this 5,000 year period, from 20,000 to 15,000 years, is when the differentiation of the races happen. You have the appearance of the yellow race, and you also have the appearance of the white race. Okay? So Diop puts another, shows the chronology in a different way. Again, these three and a half billion years ago, right, uh, excuse me, five million years ago, you have the beginning of humanity, right, in terms of these um, pre, you know, Australopithecus, afarensis, and all of that, right? You got the first Negro Homo sapiens sapiens 150,000 years ago, right? You got Grimaldi man, right, 35, 40,000 to 35 years ago. Humanity is represented only by the Negro Homo sapiens from 40,000 to 35,000 years ago. And then it's during this period, 20,000 to 10,000, is where you have racial differentiation of humanity in Europe, okay? Now, by 5,000 BC, Semites do not exist, okay? Semites meaning, if you want to use the biblical tradition, meaning the descendants of Shem. But if you were to just look at the English word, you have semi right, meaning half, semites, meaning half of one people and half of another people. You can't have semites until you have the differentiation of races. Until there's a differentiation of races, everybody is Negroid. So there's no semites in history yet, but there is black human beings. So why would you want to identify yourself with semites who don't appear in history until 15,000 to 35,000 years after the black man is in existence. Okay? Now, the first appearance of Semites in written world history takes place in 2400 BC. And then you have the rest of the history going on forward here. So this, this, this right here, 2400 BC is where the Semites actually make their appearance in documented history. Now, who are these people? Okay, so <clears throat> let me find this. Back up. So these Semites, right? Actually, I know where. Okay, here we go. All right. This map explains this chronology. Here is where this area here, the first Homo sapiens, okay? Grimaldi man migrates down here and he leaves via Gibraltar and he goes this way. And then some of them leave this way, okay? You see right here, 40,000 years ago. This is where Grimaldi man starts to go through the differentiation of the races, this area here, okay? Eventually, right, when the worm glaciation brings the cold air from the north, these people have to start migrating back south, okay? Meanwhile, you had this group that went off this way all the way to, you know, China and all of this. So you have black people 
that are living here that never went north. So they, these people here do not undergo any kind of racial differentiation. These people right here that went this route are every bit as black as these people right here. But the ones that went this way and went through Europe and, came and, and, and were here 40,000 years ago, they're the ones that had the differentiation. And these people moved south during the worm glaciation and they came back down this way and populated these areas. This is the first time in history where you have white and yellow people meeting black people. Okay? Semite is the term we used for the mixtures when these white people mixed with these yellow people and they had children. And then these mixed offspring of these white and yellow people uh, uh, mixed with black people and had children. They created what is called Semite people. Okay? A different people than these people that never left Africa. Now, these Semite peoples, earliest, right? So they, they moved south, right? And when they moved south, they discover water in what is called the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, these rivers here. And so they start migrating down these rivers until they reach here, right? And you can see, right, in, from 7,000 to 500 BC, the people had migrated to these red dots, right? These mixed breed people, right? From 6,000 to 5,300, they develop what's called the Hasuna culture, right? In these yellow areas. And then from 6,200 to 5,700 BC, they had a another group of people, right? Um, living in ice, they developed their culture. So you have different groups of mixed people, all in this Tigris Euphrates Valley from 7,000 to 5,400 BC, okay? Meanwhile, we've been living in here as modern man for 65,000 BC. So for 60,000 years before this development, right, we're living in this part, black people. You have these mixed people now, okay? Now, these mixed people, how did they get here? Again, these maps are showing you from 5,850, right, BCE, they move down and they make these settlements, okay? This is the Tigris-Euphrates Valley and what's we refer to as Mesopotamia, but if you read history, these are called the Sumerians, the Akkadians, and the Elamites. There's Elam, okay? Okay? If you go to Wikipedia, it says the term Sumerian is the common name given to the ancient non-Semitic speaking inhabitants. So again, the black people that went from here to here, that never went north, that settled in here, you have black people in the Mesopotamian area. Those people are called Sumerians, okay? The black people, right? They're called Sumerians by the East Semitic speaking Akkadians. Well, who are they? The Akkadians, are these people that migrated down this way. They're not black people, they're white and yellow people. Those are the Akkadians. So these white and yellow people come into this area and they discover there's black people. We call them the Sumerians. The Sumerians refer to themselves as, I can't even pronounce this because it's a Chino, but literally means the black-headed people. And to their land is Chitengur, okay? Um, meaning place of the noble lords. The Akkadians also call the Sumerians black-headed people, right, in the Semitic Akkadian language. Now, the Ubadians, wait a minute, who are they? That's, that's a whole, we didn't even know who that is yet. The Ubadians, though never mentioned by the Sumerians themselves, are assumed by modern day scholars to have been the first civilizing force in Sumer. Okay, so, uh, here you have the Uba, Ubayid culture, 5,400 BC. These people right here, okay? So the people that migrated from the north down south and established this culture, the Ubadians, okay? So you have the Ubadians, these are foreigners that came into this territory where there were already black people living here. 
Okay. The Ubadians drained the marshes for agriculture, developed trade, and established industries, including weaving, leatherwork, metalwork, masonry, and pottery. Sumerian civilization took form in the Uruk period, 4th millennium BC. So we're talking 4,000 BC. Okay. The earliest positively proven historical attestation of any Semitic people comes from the 30th century BC, Mesopotamia, with the East Semitic peoples of the Kish civilization entering the region originally dominated by the people of Sumer. Again, those original people were black people, right? So the earliest histor proven historical mention of any Semitic people are people who come in, enter the region, and find black people. We know that civilization was eventually restored in Mesopotamia. Partly from the record, blah, blah. okay. Archaeologists have noticed that Semitic tribes refer to as proto Akkadians. So the people who eventually became the Akkadians, these are the original Semitic peoples. Here's Akkad right here. Here's Kish. Okay, these are people, again, migrated from the north, a mix of white and yellow people, migrate from the north south into this Mesopotamian region where there are already black people, okay? The first proven historical attestation of Semitic people are these people. So again, why is black people, why would we want to identify ourselves with these white, yellow people who migrated from the north into Mesopotamia? It must be because we don't know this anthropological history. All we know is the Bible, and for some reason we think that the heroes of the Bible are the Semites. Now, archaeologists have noticed that Semitic tribes referred to as proto Akkadians from Syria and northern Mesopotamia begin to come south in waves. It's like an invasion of these people in 4000 BC. These tribes create a new kingdom on the north of the alluvial plain in a province, interestingly, called by the Sumerians. The black people call this place Uri, right? These black people when they live in the south, but otherwise described as the Kish civilization. Again, okay, here's Kish, okay? So these foreigners, these white, yellow, Semitic foreigners come in and they establish this Kish civilization, but we call it Uri, okay? Again, their arrival. These people are not indigenous. Certainly an archaeological layer that denotes a cultural change, such as a radically different style of pottery, seems to have started at Uruk around 3100 BC. So here's Uruk. And what the archaeologists are saying is that they can tell by the leftover pottery and other remnants that there was a radical cultural change. What was the cultural change? The original Sumerians the black African people were living here, had now been invaded by these Semitic Akkadians, these yellow white people that came in and they brought with them a new culture. That is the archeological evidence, okay? Now, during the third millennium, so right after this art, this cultural change, right, a close cultural symbiosis developed between the Sumerians who spoke a language isolate in the Akkadians, basically a process of integration and assimilation. They were living close to each other, and then they started assimilating each other's culture, right? A cultural symbiosis, which gave rise to a widespread bilingualism, basically Ebonics, a Creole. This is a Creole language. Sumer was conquered by the Semitic-speaking kings of the Akkadian Empire around 2270 BC. So the black people that lived there were conquered by four white, yellow, mixed-breed people called Semites. But the Sumerians continued as a sacred language. Native Sumerian rule re-emerged from about a century in the Third Dynasty of Ur at approximately 2100 to 2000 BC. The Sumerian city of Eridu on the coast of the Persian Gulf is considered to have been one of the oldest cities where the three separate cultures may have fused. What three cultures? One, 
that of the peasant Ubaidian Uba farmers living in mud brick houses and practicing irrigation. So let's go back. See, people that don't really read and research and pull out maps and constantly get clarity on what's being talked about come away with simplified understandings. Here's the Ubaidian culture. These people migrated from the north down here. These people have one culture, okay? They're peasant, they're farmers, they live in mud brick huts. Then you have the mobile nomadic Semitic pastoralists living in black tents and following herds and sheep of goats. These are also foreigners, yellow and uh, white mixed breed people, right? Who migrated down the Tigris Euphrates Valley. And then the third culture is that of the fisher folk living in reed huts in the marshlands who may have been the ancestors of the Sumerians, the black, the original black inhabitants. Okay, so here's another map showing you, right, the terms that a lot of us are familiar with. Assyria, Nineveh, Babylon, Babylonia, okay, Sumer, right? Now, following an Elamite invasion, there's Elam, right? This is the Arabian Peninsula. These people, right, Elamite invasion and the sack of war during uh, 1940, 1940 BC. Sumer came under the Amorite rule. Wait a minute, now who are these people? You, are you starting to understand that there are a whole bunch of different people in the same way that 3,000 years from now when they talk about America, there's not one America, uh, one American. There are different kinds of people in America, like Bolanta people, like German people, okay? So it was the same back then, very different people. So the Elamites, right, uh, invaded uh, this area. The Elamites came into Sumer, right? And Sumer, the black people, came under the Amorite control. So who are the Amorites, okay? Who are these Amorites? We're going to find out in a minute. Okay? So this is the landscape of what's going on right, in these people. Got Babylonia, Sumer, Chaldea, Mesopotamia. Right? Meanwhile, you got people living here, land of Canaan. You got people living in the Nile Valley. You got people living all over Saudi Arabia. Now, according to Sheikh Antibiyah, the ancients remained silent about the alleged Mesopotamian culture prior to the Chaldeans, right? Here's Chaldeans, right? These people right here. They considered the latter a case of Egyptian astronomer priests, that is to say, Negroes, okay? So again, we got Sumer, which we know are Negro people, and now we have the Chaldeans, who is a colony of Negroes that left Egypt who had already learned astronomy. See, if people aren't clear and make distinctions about who the people are, you have, you have no idea what's going on. According to the Egyptians, according to the Egyptians, according to Diodorus' reports, the Chaldeans were a colony of the priests that Belus had transported on the Euphrates and organized on the model of the mother case. And this colony continues to cultivate the knowledge of the stars, knowledge that it brought from the homeland. So it is the Chaldean form, Chaldean form, the root of the Greek word for astrology. The Tower of Babel, a step pyramid similar to the Tower, Tower of Saqqara, also known as Bas Nimrod and Temple of Baal, was probably an astronomical observatory of the Chaldeans. Now watch this. Sheikh Anta Diop is saying, this fits in for Nimrod, son of Cush, grandson of Ham, the biblical ancestor of the blacks, is the symbol of worldly power. The Bible says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Hence, the saying, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babylon, Iraq, and Akkad, all of them in the land of Sinar. From that region, Asur went forth. Now watch this. This is where Sheikh Anta Diop is wrong, and this is where the Bible is wrong. How do we know this? Because... According to the list of Ethiopian kings by His Imperial Highness Tafari Makonan, June 19, 1922, published in the book In the Country of the Blue Nile by C.F. Ray, who is, these are 
titles of an order he belongs to, who is also a commander of the Order of the Star of Ethiopia. That is the highest dignified honor that a, a non-Ethiopian citizen can receive from the Ethiopian government. So this man, who is honored by the government, the highest honor you can get, published a book by Negro University of Press, right? that published the list of Ethiopian kings that was given to him by his Imperial Highness Tafari Makone, who, who later on is crowned Emperor Haile Selassie. Nimrod is not the grandson of Ham, as the Bible says. Nimrod is, in fact, the 12th sovereign in the line of King Ori, reigning in 3776 BC and before the biblical flood. Cam, or Ham, and Kut, or Cush, appear about a thousand years later. Now, who is going to know Ethiopian history better than the 334th king of Ethiopia in the line of the original King Ori? From the Ethiopian records themselves, published by the monarchy, right? It shows that the first sovereign of this particular line was Ori in 4470 BC. Okay? This is not me saying this. These are the Ethiopian records themselves. And if you'll notice, the 12th sovereign, right, is Nimrod in the year 3776. Okay? There are a total of 21 sovereigns of the tribe of Orla, from the deluge until the fall of the Tower of Babel. So from the time of the flood, or a flood, right, to the fall of the Tower of Babel in 2713, right, 21 sovereigns. Now, sovereignty of the tribe of Cam, after the fall of the Tower of Babel, the first sovereign ruler is Cam in 2635. His son, right, Kut, son of the Brisidi, rules. So the Bible gets some of it right. There is, according to the Ethiopian records, not the Hebrew tradition, the actual oldest Ethiopian tradition says that there was a ruler named Cam and a ruler named Kut. And this came after the fall of the uh, Tower of Babel in these years. But you can clearly see Nimrod cannot be the son of Cush, right, if Nimrod was more than a thousand years prior to them. Now, we have to ask ourselves, whose records are we going to believe? The Ethiopian, their own records, or the records of a foreign people who came in as invaders? See, if you're not exposed to this information like I was, if you don't actually go to Ethiopia, and go spend time with the Ethiopian Orthodox priests like I did, or like uh, C.F. Ray did. This information was only published in one book that was barely read by anybody. Okay? So this is why you can't, I was telling one brother who was arguing this with me, I'm like, you, you can't just go, you're not going to find everything on Google. Just because you couldn't find anything doesn't mean that it's not true. So I point this out to say, look, right, you have these different groups of people, right, and the Bible is an attempt to tell a narrative, okay? It gets some of it right and some of it it doesn't get. And there are other narratives produced at the time that have counter-narratives. So how are you going to decide which one is truer than the other one? Now, it says here that the Sumerians, the ancients, right, uh, were conquered by these Amorites, right? The Sumerians came under Amorite rule. Who are these Amorites? The Amorites, right, here we go, Amorites and Hurrians. The introduction of the Bronze in the early Bronze Age, so from 3000 to 2000, so still right along with the proper chronology, okay, brought about a cultural revolution marked by the development of metallurgy, okay? Now, this is exactly in line with what I've been teaching about Balanta history. When, when I make the case that our ancestors left the Nile Valley because a group of people called the Masinu were the first to what? Learn how to use iron and make weapons. So here you have the introduction of the Bronze Age during that same beginning time period, 3000, 
brought about a cultural revolution marked by the development of metallurgy and a decline in pottery. Okay. The Amorites, who were originally nomads from the desert regions to the east. Again, right? Nomads, right? Semites, nomads from the east. These are who the uh, 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 Amorites are, okay? To the east. That, so that's this way. All right. The Amorites launched raids and harassments and attacks against the cities in Mesopotamia. In addition to the Amorites, other invaders, including the Hurrians, also called the Horites in the Old Testament, also came to Canaan from the north. There's no black people from the north. By this time, the differentiation of the races has happened. So these these, these Hurrians, right, are a, a, a white and yellow, and then a mix of white and yellow people, right? The Late Bronze Age, from 1500 to 1200 BC, was marked by incursions of new Amorite marauders, meaning, again, Amorites are what? Nomadic Semites from the East. These were Amorites displaced by the fall of the Hammur Hammurabian dynasty in Babylon. As it were, over the time, the nomadic Amorites were joined by Amorites who had previously been in Mesopotamia. Two different groups of Amorites, two different groups of mixed white-yellow people, right, joined forces, and now they start invading the territories to the west. Okay? So that by now, the total of these Amorites had become the dominant element of the population in Canaan. Okay? Again, Canaan, right here. So here you go, right? You had black people that were the remnants of the original Grimaldi man who eventually became the Sumerians. And then you had these nomadic, Semitic, white, yellow mixed people, right, from these different civilizations. They already conquered the black people of Sumer. They already conquered the black people of Chaldea who were migrants from Egypt. Now they come this way and they start to meet the black people here. Two different groups of people. These people already here are not Semites. These people are, okay? This is not me making this up. This is actual freaking history. Many of these Amorites, such as the biblical Abraham, continued on to Egypt. Okay, so now Abraham is an Amorite. We now, according to the Bible, right, he's this Semitic person, this, right? Genesis 11, 27, 32. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran, da 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 right? You know, uh, the land of his nativity in the Ur of Chaldees, Sumer, okay? Now, remember, Sumer was originally black people, but by this time it had been conquered by these nomadic Semites. That's where Abraham comes from. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, blah, blah, blah. They came unto Haran and dwelt there. Okay? So again, here's Ur. This is where, right, they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans into the land of Canaan. These Semitic people, they go to Haran. Okay? This is Abraham and his family. Okay. And then Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there. Okay, so here's another map. 2300 BC. You have the Elamites, you have the Hurrians that we were just talking about. Remember, they came from the north, right? And you have these Semitic nomads, right? Now, in here, this is desert, right? They're, they're, they're not doing agriculture here. They're not building cities here. Why are all the cities built here? Because that's where the water is. Why are all the cities here? That's where the water is. There's no cities here. These people are nomads. Okay? And you can see. So we have Hurrians, right? You have these different people. Right? Akkad. There you go right there. Okay? Now watch this. Okay? According to Dia, after many ups and downs, the Canaanites, the people that was living here, the black people that was living here, and the white tribes, symbolized by Abraham and his descendants, Isaac's lineage, blended to become the Jewish people of today. 
This has nothing to do with our ancestors because remember, this is 2300 BC. We had already left this Nile Valley 700 to 800 years prior to all of this. So when I say Balanta people have nothing to do with being Hebrew or Semitic people, the reason why I'm saying that is because the Semitic people hadn't even got into the Nile Valley yet. And we were already gone by 700 years. Now, to a person that doesn't know this, and all they have is the Bible, and they think the Bible is the word of God and explains history from the beginning, right? It, it began with Adam and Eve, and then the ninth generation from Adam is Noah, and then Noah had three sons, Ham, Sham, and Japheth, right? And then the whole world is populated from these three people. If that is your framework, then... By that, you think everybody on the earth descends from these three people, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And that is just not true. That's a narrative trying to describe world history to an illiterate people, right, who aren't able to understand how the world was actually populated by different kinds of people. So they tell a story, an allegory, right? to basically explain why there are different people in the north called Japheth, why there's a different people in this area called Semites, and why there's a different people in this area called Ham or Black people. It's just a narrative to try to explain to a people who don't have the benefit of science and technology and education. Okay? Diop says that when these Semitic people came into Canaan and met Black people, that is where the basis of what we call the Jewish people today begins. And he goes on to quote, So Hemer and his son Sitchum went to the gate of their city and spoke to their fellow citizens. These men, right, black people living in Canaan, they said, they said, these men, meaning these Semitic people who wandered in here, are friendly. Let them dwell with us and trade in the land since there is ample room for them. Let us marry their daughters and give them our daughters to marry. So there you go. This is why Diop is saying that. The black people and these white Semitic people came in here, traded daughters, had children, and this is the beginning of what would later become the Jewish people. Now, those few lines, again, this is Diop speaking, those few lines, which seem to be a ruse, nonetheless reveal the economic imperatives which at that time were to govern the relations between the white invaders and the black Canaanites. Phoenician history, right? Phoenician refers to the black people living here. Now watch this. The black people living here live on this waterway. They had boats and they're sailing to all the places on the Mediterranean doing trade, okay? The black people were the merchants, they had cities. When these white nomads came in there, it was the black people that was dominant. The reason why the white people wanted to settle here was because of economic benefits in the same way that people come to America because of the economic benefit. So these nomadic Semite peoples, right, they was the bottom of the rung. Diop says, Phoenician history is therefore incomprehensible only if we ignore the biblical data according to which the Phoenicians, in other words, the Canaanites, were originally Negroes, already civilized, with whom the nomadic, uncultured white tribes later mixed. I'm not saying that. Diop, who is a better authority than I am, is saying that. Okay? This is how the lasting alliance between the Egyptians and Phoenicians. Okay. So... In Egypt, these Amorites became known as the Habiru, or Hapiru, which meant one who sells his services. Why? These people, these Semites, they didn't have merchant uh, 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 social structures. They didn't have trade networks throughout the area. So they came in, and they came in as servants, as laborers. They would sell their services. Whether these services were as mercenaries or tradesmen is unknown. In time, the number of Amorites in northern Egypt was sufficient to overthrow Egyptian rule and establish an independent region of Egypt ruled by the Amorites, since known as the Hyksos. Okay? So they get a new name, a new identity called Hyksos, meaning foreign kings 
or shepherd kings. The Egyptian historian Manetho and the traitor Hebrew Josephus Flavius, right? Josephus Flavius was actually a Hebrew militant who got captured by the Romans and to save himself sold his services to the Roman emperor uh, Tass, uh, um, Titus. And he helped the Romans write a, a, a book that said that the Jewish prophecies of the Messiah referred to the Roman emperor. And this is what became known as the Gospels. Okay? But what this is saying is the Egyptian historian at the time, Manetho, and this Hebrew scholar, Josephus Flavius, both wrote of the Amorite coup as an invasion. An invasion of foreign... Now, why would black people want to identify with a group of mixed white, yellow, and now black people who invaded our black territory? That would be because we don't know history and we've been brainwashed by this book called the Bible thinking that the Bible explains history. Not really. It just gives a narrative. You have to look behind. Now, so these Amorites, who became known as the Habiru, right? Diop also writes in another book, he says, in the Bible, when the first white races reached the place, they found a black race there, the Canaanites. They departed for the land of Canaan. Uh, uh, and, and so these are the biblical scriptures. Here's the about that the Bible says. Now watch this. Okay? According to in Wikipedia, the Shashu, from the Egyptian, this is pronounced Shashwe, Shashu, were Semitic speaking cattle nomads in, the, in Canaan from the late Bronze Age. Well, we just, we just proved this. We just went over the documented history. Okay? They were organized in clans under a tribal chief and were described as brigands, mercenaries. Okay? How do we know this? The earliest known reference to the Shashu occur in a 15th century. BCE list of peoples in the Transjordan region, basically land of Can you know, from Canaan all the way down to Egypt. The name appears in a list of Egypt's enemies inscribed on, a, on column bases at the Temple of Sola built by Amenhotep III. I'm not saying that. Here's an actual picture of the writing from that time on the temple. You can see the hieroglyphics here. And once the hieroglyphics were deciphered, you see it right here. Here's the hieroglyph, right? Here are the hieroglyphs. This is the alliteration of the hieroglyphs. And it's shashu, meaning nomad. Okay? Now, this list, copied later, 200 years later, in a 13th century BCE, either by Seti I or Ramses II or Amara West, the list mentions six groups of shashu. The Shashu of Sarur, the Shashu of Rubin, the Shashu of Sint, the Shashu of Rubur, the Shashu of Yawlach, and the Shashu of Pips. Two Egyptian texts, right, dated to the period of Amenhotep III in the 14th century, right, and another text refer to Yahu in the land of the Sosu -so -so nomads, in which Yahweh is, or Yahu is a toponym. Regarding the name Yahweh, Michael Astor observed that the hieroglyph rendering corresponds very precisely to the Hebrew tetragrammaton YHWH, or Yahweh, and antedates the hitherto oldest records of that divine name on the Moabite stone by over 400 years. So, prior to this knowledge, there was this thing called the Moabite stone that was considered the first reference to Yahweh. But now they know that 500 years before the Moabite stone, on this temple, right, is referring to the Shashu of Yahweh. This is the first documented piece in history of these people who would later become known as Hebrew or Israelites. These are not our people. This is so. This is 1,300 years after Belanta ancestors have left the Nile Valley. We have nothing to do with this. Okay? By the 14th century BC, before the cult of Yahweh had reached Israel, groups of Edomites and Midianites worshipped Yahweh as their God. Now, these are black people. What black people are we talking about? 
right? The black people who were living here when these nomadic people came here and when they mixed, some of those people that mixed, right, were worshipers of this Yahweh of these Semitic nomads. This is how you get black people worshiping Yahweh. But there were, it was not an indigenous thing. These people are converted by these foreigners. Okay? Now, Donald Redford argues that the earliest Israelites, semi-nomadic highlanders in central Palestine, mentioned on the Renetta Stella at the end of the 13th century, are to be identified as the Shashu Enclave. Since later biblical tradition portrays Yahweh as coming forth from Seir, the Shashu, originally from Moab, you have to look these places up on a map so that you can literally visualize them, and northern Edom, went on to form one major element in the amalgam that would constitute Israel. Israel is a conglomeration of a bunch of different people, which later established the kingdom of Israel. For his own analysis of the El Amarna letters, Anson Rainey, another scholar, concluded that the description of the Shashu best fits that of the early Israelites. Now watch this. The Habiru, sometimes written as Hapiru, and more accurately as Hapiru, is a term used in the second millennium throughout the Fertile Crescent or the land of Canaan for people variously described as rebels, outlaws, raiders, mercenaries, bowmen, servants, slaves, and laborers. Why would black people in America want to identify themselves with rebels, outlaws, raiders, mercenaries, servants, slaves, and laborers who are the descendants of white and yellow people that came from the north and mixed with black people? One, that has nothing to do with Balantipi. The word Habiru, right, uh, is more information, right, blah, 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 blah. Not all Habiru were murderers and robbers. Some more information. Now let's get to this, right? Uh, you have documentation that says that the Apiru rebelled against their common overlord, the Pharaoh. The biblical word Hebrew, like Habiru, denotes a social category, not an ethnic group. The Abiru Hebiru has only one element in an early Israel composed of many different peoples. Now watch this. We actually have a map, right? Listen to it. Letters mentioning the Hebiru written by the ruler of an identified city. Okay? All of these places had mayors, right? Basically mayors who wrote in their records an invasion of these people called Habiru. And all they were doing was causing freaking trouble because they're murderers, thieves, brigands, they're nomads, they don't know God, they don't, they don't have any kind of civilization like what we have in the Nile Valley. Okay? So what I'm saying is the documentation of who these people are are well documented. This is not speculation. You have actual, like if somebody a thousand years from now were to go to the Belanta website, they would see the documentation that we're putting up this year. Written at this time. They'd be like, yeah, this is what they wrote back then. Those, we have those records, so we know who these people are. And so, again, here's another map, right, showing the Arab Yemeni Israelite. You have the Kasku or Shashi. One of the reasons why it's so difficult to get a handle on this is because the names are always changing depending on whose particular cultural narrative you're listening to. So you have the Katsu or Shashu people coming from the north. You have the Abiru or Apiro people, right? And these are the people that come into Egypt. Now, I always get asked about, what about the Ethiopian Falashagians? Okay? First, let me go into this. Tradition holds that the word, that should be word Ethiopia comes from the Greek. If you look at Wikipedia, Wikipedia says the Greek name, Ethiops, or Ethiopian, is a compound word that means I burn or face. Okay? This is the tradition we've been told. Everybody, oh yeah, Ethiopia, it comes from the Greeks. It means people with the burnt faces. Okay? However, the Greek formation, this is Wikipedia still, may be a folklore etymology because the ancient Egyptian term Atiu Abu, or Atiu Abu, which means robbers of heart. So Atiu, Itiu, Abu, okay? 
So there's an alternative here. Now, but watch this. Okay. What I, I'm going to skip some of this information. But that same king list, right, from Ethiopia shows that in 1800, there is the king Ethiopus. And then, in 100 years later, there's king Ethiopus II. Now, wait a minute. The Greeks didn't come into Egypt, let alone penetrate further south into, you know, what we call Ethiopia, until 800 to 700 BC. So, a thousand years before the Greeks were even in this territory, you had Ethiopian rulers calling themselves Ethiopia. So, how could Ethiopia be a Greek word when Greeks had never even been in the territory and the Ethiopian own records are showing at least two rulers using that name? So much of our history is a lie. We now have the benefit of new tools, new research, new information. We have to rewrite history. You cannot just accept these narratives that have been handed to us. Now, to finish this up, just so people understand, right? There's a whole history on how this. Um, uh, okay, so I'll go into this. Right? As at least as early as 850 CE, the name Ethiopia also occurs in many translations of the Old Testament in an allusion to Nubia. So this same territory, sometimes called Nubia. The ancient Hebrew texts identify Nubia as Cush. So now we got three different names. You got Nubia, Cush, and Ethiopia, which makes it confusing for a lot of people. However, the New Testament, the Greek term Ethiops, uh, does occur referring to servants of Con Queen Kandaki of Cush. Following the Hellenic and biblical traditions, right, um, the ex uh, basically Axum, or the King, the Axumite Empire, According to their records, was a ruler governed an area which was flanked to the west by the territory of Ethiopia and the territory of South Sea. The Axumite king, Izana, would eventually conquer Nubia the following century, and the Axumites thereafter appropriated the designation Ethiopians for their own kingdom. Okay? So what are we talking about here? Okay? At that time, you had one group of people called Axum. You had another group of people that had this territory called Nabotia. You had another group called Makuria. You had Sosa or Soba, right? Um, you actually had other territories called Awa, Mero, Makuria. Basically what happened was, right, the people in Aksu got invaded by people coming from Syria. A Semitic people. One of them met this person named Philip, who was part of the kingdom of Axum, part of the government. He was the treasurer and converted him right, to Christianity. Okay? These Semitic peoples who are now carrying Christianity right, converted King Azana. King Azana became a Christian uh, kingdom. The rest of the people in this area fought against that. They said, no, we don't want this foreign religion. These are actually the heroes of black people. But the way they teach Ethiopian history, we always want to glorify the, the big city, as if having a big city makes you honorable. These were the sellout traders who submitted to the foreigners. The other people in this area didn't. But the way they hand on the history is they always study Axum and they talk about the virtues of the Christian of Axum without telling you that there were all these other peoples and cities that was fighting against them. Okay? Now, when the Semitic people described above, these mixed race nomads wandered into Ethiopia. They mixed and converted some of the people to their religion called Judaism. Judaism didn't start in Ethiopia, it was brought to Ethiopia. This began with the Jewish rule of Egypt, which was 500 years before the Assyrian invasion. Remember, these Hyksoks. These people, these nomadic shepherds who wandered into Egypt, right? Remember, here we go, Hyksos, from the Hekru Shashu, four nomads, came in uh, to Canaan in 1800 BC. These refugees then came in and ruled Egypt uh, 107 years from 1630 to 15. So you had these Jewish foreigners ruled Egypt, and some of them penetrated all the way into Ethiopia, right? 
and mixed with these people here. And when you do DNA testing on these people, it shows that the genetic record shows that the Falashas have DNA originating from Arabia and the Orient that distinguishes them from the other indigenous people living in the area. The frequencies of Y chromosome haplo haplotypes in Falasha genes in each of the one, there's the data, right, show that uh, the Falasha uh, uh, sample, that the Arabic haplotype is the main haplotype present in the Falashas. The second most commonly found haplotype in the Falasha Jews and Ethiopians is the Oriental type. So you can't even refer to the Ethiopian Falasha Jews to make your case, right? The relatively high frequency of haplotype 4 in the Falasha Jews, a haplotype rarely found in Europe or in African populations, sets the Falasha Jews apart from the other Ethiopians. These singularities indicate a mode of genetic differentiation of Falasha Jews based on genetic drift, which is a major force of small isolated populations. These are the heroes of black people, Makuria and Awa. Moreau fought bravely, but they got conquered. And it was this sellout, uh, 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 um, sellout uh, Jude, Jude, uh, 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 converts to Judaism, who then converted to Christianity that we think are the glorious Ethiopians. The Greeks ruled Egypt for 300 years before the expansion of the Roman Empire, right? And so here you have the breakdown. The Jewish rule for uh, uh, 500 years, the Assyrian interludes, the Persians rule for 185 years, the Greeks for 275 years, the Romans for 700 years, and the Arabs, okay? Ethiopia was, in 350 AD, the armies, these invading Semitic armies, Right, who have uh, 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 Jewish roots and are now converted to Christianity, right, invade and destroy Monroe. Ethiopia is now split into three major states, Nobadai bordering Egypt at the first cataract, Makuria, the powerful kingdom in the middle, uh, at Dongala, and Awa. After the collapse of the central black empire in the fourth century, the Christian churches spread more rapidly through the now independent kingdom. The population in this kingdom bordering, uh, bordering Cauca Caucasianized Egypt, by this point Egypt had been turned white, was now predominantly Afro-European and Afro-Asian. The population in Egypt at this time was now mixed breed Semitic people, Afro-European and Afro-Asian. All of the indigenous black people that hadn't mixed migrated south. So, which migration, or when we go back to Balanta, remember, 1,300 years before all of this, Balanta people that were living in Fayum and Asi, which we call Tameri and Tanihisi, we left because of our conflict with the Messi. We traveled this road, which was 40 days, got to El Fashur, which is considered Darfur today. And from Darfur, we migrated to Lake Chad, we stayed there, and a bunch of people from this area followed hundreds of years later, and we just kept moving west to escape. So when you have people saying Balanta people are the lost tribe of Benjamin, it is the most confused, erroneous information that there is. These people haven't done the research and really learned in their mind and got it crystal clear the geography who each different people are during each different time period. Okay, so that's my presentation. I put that together once and for all to try to make it clear so that none of our people will be have the wrong ideas or be misled, right, and not know their real history. I'm glad I recorded that.